it's a real pleasure to be here and to kick off the morning session of the 2021 President's Conference. So my paper this morning looks at how lessons and experience moved between Gallipoli and the Western Front um, in 1915 and just kind of a little bit going into 1916 as well. And I think what's interesting is that how militaries exchange experience and best practice between campaigns and theatres was and remains a long-standing challenge. We only need to look at the late Victorian period to see the British Army's real reticence about disseminating specific lessons from its colonial wars. In the Second World War, the methods, the experience that Eighth Army veterans brought to 21st Army Group didn't always um, serve 21st Army Group particularly well. And of course, more recently, we have discussions continuing over whether appropriate lessons and experiences were transferred between Iraq and Afghanistan. I think the important thing to note up front here first is that there are a number of frictions and barriers associated with the movement of knowledge and experience across theatres. These are challenges such as context, relevance and scepticism. And I think in the First World War, there are continual attempts to circulate knowledge both in theatre, but also between them. Sometimes these attempts paid off, sometimes they're subject to really heavy adaptation, sometimes they're ignored, and of course, oftentimes they're tried and subsequently fail. And I think the variety of potential outcomes tells us something about the military, in this case, the British Army's learning process, but also the nature of the military organization itself. So what my paper will do this morning is kind of use the case studies of Gallipoli and the Western Front with some reference to the Australian Imperial Force to argue that failure to apply experience across theatres or conversely applying experience and it not necessarily having the desired effect shouldn't be seen as a negative reflection on the army's learning process. Instead, I think that it reveals, for better or worse really, like the inherently human act of applying proven lessons or experiences um, that often overlook the conditions and context that exist in different military theatres. So that's the plan for this morning. If I turn to the first of my case studies then, say the movement of lessons from the Western Front to Gallipoli, here I'm kind of challenging uh, the myth that was initially propagated by the Australian official historian Charles Bean that, and I quote, little advice came from the Western Front. Well, it is certainly true in 1915 that there wasn't what I suppose we would call a formal policy of sharing knowledge between theatres, this of course doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And the means through which Western Front practice and experience is shared with formations in Gallipoli and other theatres is diverse. But I think in the interest of time, I'm just gonna focus on publications and people. So formations were encouraged to use pre-war publications such as field service regulations, as you can see on screen there, but they're also exposed to recent literature from the Western Front. And again, we see this clearly with, with the Australian uh, Imperial Force. And there's a constant drive by the AIF's senior command to really seek out and disseminate that, that latest literature. And William Birdwood plays a quite a key role here in that he is seeking out that latest literature from the Western Front as early as December 1914. And he requests from the War Office enough copies of publications for distribution to NCOs as well as officers. So there's a real kind of sense here of like a, a whole force approach to, to understanding this latest literature. Now, of course, just because a doctrinal or you know, training pamphlet arrives in theatre, of course, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be read or used. And I think that's, that's a truism, perhaps even to this day. But I think what's interesting is that there is evidence 
that these pamphlets were used by formations, particularly during pre-deployment training in Egypt. So we see a series of training notes, for example, from the 1st Australian Division in January 1915, highlighting the need for officers and senior NCOs to read and act upon the various pamphlets and information that are coming out of the Western Front. And we also see John Monash's 4th Australian Brigade receiving and training, um, uh, training according even to notes on artillery in the present war. Now, I think what's really interesting is that we have a flurry of publications coming into Egypt and Gallipoli, but there's a real reticence when it comes to enforcing this literature. So pamphlets often come with a, a caveat around the difference in conditions and methods. So the War Office, for example, when it sends Birdwood these pamphlets, such as Notes from the Front, Volumes 1 and 2, and Notes on Artillery in the Present War, it says there's a considerable dissimilarity in conditions and methods between fighting on the Suez Canal and on the Aisne or the Lease. And so what you have is almost each force and each formation is left to decide and discern the value of the information that it has for use in theatre. So in short, the lessons that are coming out of the Western Front are highly sought after, but they're not put into practice unthinkingly. I think to complement um, this, not reliance, but interest in publications that, that come out of the Western Front, in the early years of the war, we see the very personal approach of the British Army coming to the fore. And this is quite notable through the use of informal social networks. So what you see, not just in 1915, but I think throughout the course of the war, you see individuals drawing on and exploiting their own personal and professional connections in order to acquire up-to-date practice from the Western Front. Birdwood, for example, top left there, is frequently corresponding with Maurice Hankey, who's the secretary to the Committee of Imperial Defence, about what's going on in other theatres. In October 1915, Hankey writes to Birdwood referring to the use of, of smoke bombs in recent operations in France. He also highlights the new Stokes mortar and the Livens projector as potentially being of use at Anzac. Similarly, we see Henry de Beaver de Lisle, who's the commander of the 29th Division, keeping in contact with his former staff of the 1st Cavalry Division on the Western Front. And through these contacts, in fact, I think it was a former sort of um, brigade staff officer who was then working in a machine gun training school, he acquires the kind of latest thinking on machine gun tactics. And de Lisle is, is advocating to Hamilton about the need to establish uh, a machine gun training school for the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force, but if that's not possible, he'd quite like to set one up in the 29th Division. You also have senior generals on the Western Front kind of taking an interest in the Gallipoli campaign. So Henry Rawlinson, bottom left there, sends Alec Godley uh, quite a lot about his experiences of dealing with, with barbed wire and trenches, or at least the experiences in his formation. Now, this might seem like, you know, an old boys network um, and it might seem incredibly parochial, but I think it acted as a really useful way of exchanging knowledge and experience relatively quickly. So you're not having to wait for best practice to be identified, sucked up into the organization and then spat back out again. So it's, it's a little bit more rapid than that process. Now, of course, there are real downsides to this informal exchange of, of experience. And this is because it's opportunistic. It's, it's kind of of the moment. And aside from it being captured in a letter, it's actually quite rarely codified um, into any kind of publication. And I think the challenge of this is that experiences and knowledge could be lost, reinvented or, or duplicated even under the fog of war. But what's key here is that social networks are an intrinsic part 
of the army's culture. It's kind of the, the grease that, that ensures that the whole machine works. So even if the army had wanted to, it couldn't shut down these informal exchanges from occurring. To complement the exploitation of social networks, we see the kind of use of individual initiative. Um, and as part of that, um, a greater use of what we would call now teach the teacher schemes. So someone gets knowledge and then they teach it to their subordinates who then go on and, and do the same. And this really helps kind of circulate knowledge and experience throughout a force. And I wanna kind of highlight here the experience of Colonel Charles Rosenthal, an Australian artillery officer who is invalided from Gallipoli. He sent to the UK for R&R. &R. And while he's there, he's, he becomes a real thorn actually in the war officer's side in that he's constantly asking them to, for permission to go to the Western Front uh, to see, see what's happening over there. And after a while, you know, the, the war office gives in and Rosenthal is billeted with the British First Division. And he spends a lot of time with its general staff, with headquarters. You can see on the slide there that he's also visiting the French um, and going into the front line as well. And his diary is absolutely fascinating. He talks about, you know, quite specific details on establishments, on enemy dispositions, on gun emplacements. And he's an artillery officer, right? So he gets really interested in the kinds of fuses that are used within the 1st Division and 4th Corps more broadly. And Rosenthal recalls attending a lecture given by a Royal, Art a Royal Engineer Captain, I should say, regarding the construction and the maintenance of trenches. And what's interesting is that Rosenthal then gives his own kind of informal lecture about the details of some of the trench work that was happening at Gallipoli. Now this tour, it only lasts 12 days, but on his departure, he's given samples of shells, fuses, aerial photographs, maps. And when he gets back to his formation, which by now is, is based in Egypt, Rosenthal shares this. He discusses the findings of his trip with his colleagues and subordinates, and is really kind of acting as that informal conduit between these two particular theaters of operations. So I think what these uh, like discrete examples show is that experience and best practice are disseminated to the Gallipoli theater. Yet this predilection, I think, for Western Front experience raises concerns. And these concerns primarily focus on the question of relevance, which is never far from, from commanders' uh, minds. So there's a good example of this, which is um, the appointment of Julian Bing to command the Ninth Corps. And he's criticized by Ian Hamilton for adhering to Western Front artillery principles. So Hamilton writes to Lord Kitchener, I think saying, all these fellows from France come here with this idea. Bing would like to have four days successive bombardment for an hour and then attack. And he speaks of one high explosive shell per yard as if they were shells we could pick up on the seashore. For some commanders who derived from France, it really did take them time to cut their coats according to their operational uh, cloth. And this is commented on after the war. So Guy Dornay, for example, who's a staff officer at MEF headquarters. After the war, he remarked, as you can see on screen here, on the well-marked tendency to apply the lessons of experience indiscriminately and to run to extremes. And he highlighted how theater, in theatres like Gallipoli in Egypt, in which no colossal artillery could be brought up or maintained for a position of warfare, the application of some of the methods of the main theater of war was not very clearly apparent. Now, of course, there are many ways that you can deal with this issue of relevance. Two ways are to adapt that experience or to just ignore it. One subaltern in the 5th Highland Light Infantry recalled how through his unit's repeated study of notes on trench warfare in France, the unit had become, and I'm quoting here, permeated with the theory that where one's presence is revealed by a flare, safety from rifle or machine gun fire is only to be attained by lying down and remaining perfectly motionless. 
he goes on. But familiarity breeds contempt. And as we gradually realized that the flares were much further to our front than we had thought, the necessity for this uncomfortable performance became less and less obvious until we discarded it altogether. Now, this kind of sounds like a pretty mundane um, example, but I think what's interesting is it kind of represents here a micro adaptation in contact. The looking at a pamphlet, looking at the reality and deciding that there's a little bit of a dissonance between the two. Related to this question of relevance um, is the fear of trench mindedness and the erosion of the offensive spirit of the force. Hamilton, he's a firm advocate of Western Front experience and practice, bemoaned the fact that senior officers have been saturated with pamphlets and instructions and trench warfare. And their one idea is to dig an enormous hole to hide themselves in. Alex Godley is inclined to agree. He believed that the failure of, at Sari Bear was due to training in trench warfare, which had given all the idea that directly they came under shrapnel or shell fire, they must at once dig in. And interestingly, this is picked up in the 1932 Kirk report on the lessons learned from the Great War, which again highlighted what it perceived the failings of certain senior commanders who tried to apply the methods applicable to the war in France to which they had little relation. I think what's interesting is that the Kirk report in many respects is right to criticize the conduct of senior officers, but should we be surprised that officers and commanders at Gallipoli were grasping for potential proven solutions to the problems they were facing? Furthermore, should we be surprised when those solutions didn't always work out when the context had changed? So they were applying them in a different set of circumstances. I think the fact that individuals were attempting to apply techniques that had proven successful elsewhere shouldn't be seen as an instance of stupidity or an incapacity for rational thought. I think what it does illustrate is the potency of experience particularly when it comes from a main theater of operations, the danger of that experience and the need to treat it with caution. So as I move on to the kind of shorter second case study here, relevance and concerns around trench mindedness were, were key considerations relating to the flow of experience from the Western Front to Gallipoli. But what I would argue is that almost the reverse flow of experiences from Gallipoli to the Western Front were overwhelmingly characterized by skepticism. And I think we can see some kind of long term parallels here with the pre-war British Army in that colonial tactics had little appreciable impact on the formal training of the army itself. You know, there were concerns there that these methods wouldn't necessarily stand up against a continental enemy. And I think we see similar concerns coloring the British Expeditionary Forces view of the experience and best practice emerging from Gallipoli. So for example, when you have the first formations arriving on the Western Front from Gallipoli, you get a number of eyebrows kind of raised about their fighting quality, even though many had undergone several months of, of pre-deployment training. But of course, even with pre-deployment training today, it's impossible to train for everything. And so, you know, the constraints for, by, by time and finite resources meant that for formations in the Australian Imperial Force, attempts were made to train troops to a limited level of proficiency across the board, which effectively turned them into jacks of all trade, but masters of none. And I think, this is picked up on by, by senior commanders. So despite this, this engagement in pre-deployment training, commanders such as Rawlinson, uh, William Robertson, Douglas Haig were, were initially quite skeptical about these newcomers. So Haig in 1916 commented on the poor performance of Hunter Weston's Eighth Corps. And he noted how the majority of his officers are amateurs in hard fighting. And some think they know much more than they do of this kind of warfare simply because they'd been at Gallipoli. Recent scholarship has kind of supported this idea that beyond that valuable combat experience gained at Gallipoli, there's little in the way of long lasting military learning and adaptation taking place. 
And I think for me, the challenge of this contention is that it paints learning and adaptation in a particular way. And that's as a process of continuous improvement. Was it the case that formations learn nothing and fail to adapt? Or were they simply applying these lessons in the wrong context? And again, it comes back to the point that I made earlier that tried and tested proven methods would often be drawn upon when faced with a new situation. And I think the consequence of that is that drawing on that past experience, even if it has been proven, didn't always lead to positive outcomes. Now, I think the kind of the, the big question here, right, is was any of the experience gleaned at Gallipoli useful? And I think this is gonna be a very academic yes and no answer. I think at the tactical level, there are examples to suggest that the methods used at Gallipoli were in some ways applied on the Western Front with some degree of success. So Robert Stevenson, fantastic historian, has shown how Hooky Walker's plans at Pozier drew on a combination of his experience at Gallipoli, but also a review of observations made by more experienced British formations. And what's interesting is that at Gallipoli, Walker reduce the assault distance for his troops at Lone Pine. When he gets to the Western Front, that kind of reaffirms um, the necessity of, of doing so. Walker makes the decision to attack from an unexpected direction, or at least not the same one used in previous attacks. Again, Stevenson kind of suggests that this is influenced by his experiences during the August offensive. And I think while less obvious, but perhaps no less important is the leavening of experience that's provided by the Gallipoli campaign, particularly for staff officers. And I think it's very easy to take this for granted, and I don't think it should be. And neither should the engendering of a mindset that's focused on improvisation and adaptation. And I think engendering that culture of adaptation is often more important than the adaptation themselves. Yet I think we still have a tendency to focus on, on the latter, so the shiny new kit and the new technological developments. And so for me, Gallipoli, for its myriad strategic and operational faults, had forced formations and individuals to improvise, to adapt for a widely differing set of circumstances, which I think did have value when they found themselves on the Western Front. So examining this reverse flow of experience and lessons, I think draws out three points. The first is that potency of previous experience. So how an organization deals with previous or new experiences, I think tells us a lot about it as an institution. So when the AIF arrives in its two tranches to the Western Front, it has no, I suppose, no excuse but to deal or draw on its, its Gallipoli and, and Egypt experiences. And we see this with Walker at Pozier, but you then get that experience melding with that then gained on the Western Front. Secondly, learning is as much about failure as it is about success. Incorrect lessons are identified and applied, but I think the problem with learning in wartime is that those incorrect lessons and the application thereof obviously leads to significant um, casualties um, in not just in terms of, of blood, but also in treasure as well. And finally, context is so important. What worked at Gallipoli might not work on the Western Front and vice versa. And experience and knowledge um, is often understood and interpreted in different ways by different individuals and formations, often with quite unintended results, and this can be for better or worse. And to close out this section before I conclude, I don't think we can overlook individuals' natural tendency to use previous experiences as almost fixed points of reference. So individuals and formations don't become blank slates because they, they move to a different operational theater. And I think um, Monash's experience of training the third Australian division um, kind of sums this up really well. And he writes in the letter to his wife, as you can see on screen here, if they give us time and equip us speedily, we're going to have some division far and away better than Bridges took away with him. Because now that we have had 20 months experience of war, there will not be a minute wasted in teaching things the men will afterwards have to unlearn my six weeks in France will be a powerful help to me in this respect. 
So I'm going to briefly conclude because um, I'm conscious of time. So the differences between the Western Front and Gallipoli are stark. And I think that this requires us to treat theatres on their own terms. Yet while each theatre has its own unique context, problems and conditions, that doesn't stop the inherently human act of applying hard-won lessons and experience because they've worked somewhere else. And so while individuals may be aware of the differences between military theatres, it is incredibly difficult to prevent individuals drawing on their past experiences. I think all of us are a product of our experiences and they play a really important shaping role in, in some of the decisions we make, again, for better or worse. And I think related to this, and is it's a point that I bang on about, so I'm sure many people in the audience will be sick to death of hearing about this, is the reality that knowledge and experience are inherently sticky in that they cling to people and they cling to their original context and environment. And this complicates the process of learning because on paper, learning is really simple. It's the movement of knowledge and experience from point A to point B. But the reality is really different. It's disjointed and fragile. It's subject to barriers, cul-de-sacs, wrong turns. And I think we need to spend more time reconciling and reintegrating the very human and organizational frictions that are associated with learning. And I think by doing this, we are rewarded with a more comprehensive, more complete perhaps understanding of how militaries learn and change in times of crisis. So I'm gonna end it there. Thank you so much and looking forward to your questions. Thanks uh, to Amy. Roger and Rocky for those excellent um, presentations. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Q&A time now. From Mark Openshaw, uh, did Gallipoli campaign leaders, for example, Hamilton, Delisle, Hunter, Weston, bring lessons learned slash mistakes to Hague's some campaign planning? That's a really great question, Mark. And um, I don't definitively know the answer and I'm going to look to Gary in case he knows anything in terms of whether there's any relationship between what people from Gallipoli are bringing to the table in terms of Hague's vision <clears throat> for the Somme campaign. I think it would be unlikely if there wasn't a degree of bringing over you know what's worked in Gallipoli and can we try it on the western front. Obviously not so much the case with Hamilton because he doesn't hold active command once he's um, uh, removed from command in in late 1915 but I think people people see Hunter Weston and Delisle on the western front as almost kind of being um, kind of have shot their bolt for a bit I think is the impression that's given um, and even during the later stage of the Gallipoli campaign comments are raised about Delisle and and whether he's really kind of up up to it so I think that you get that kind of skepticism when they come back which could mean that if they make mistakes that and that's blamed somehow on the fact that they've come from Gallipoli and there is that you know looking like side eye a little bit about about what they're bringing over but I couldn't definitively tell you whether there's that kind of line of causation between the kind of stuff they were doing in Gallipoli and and how that manifests in in the kind of planning of, of the song campaign but I, I will defer to Gary in case he has anything else to, to add. Uh, it's a really good question, which I must admit I haven't thought about. But it would be something worth um, exploring. Just a, a couple of points is one thing which shocked Brits and Australians and Kiwis coming, but coming from Gallipoli to Western Front is the sheer scale of the killing in France and Belgium as opposed to, to Gallipoli. The, the, the figures for... Australian killed at Gallipoli, 23,000, something like that. It's about the same for Australian killed in six weeks on the Somme at Pozieres and, and Mouquet Mou 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 Farm. And there is a sense, uh, Haig famously and very, very rudely says to second Australian division after they mess up their first attack, you know, you're not fighting bashy bazooks now. I mean, he was being pretty tactless, but he wasn't entirely wrong. There was a sense that people who had come from Gallipoli had to learn to step up to fight in a much more 
dangerous situation. I think all of that actually sort of went against the idea there's much read across from Gallipoli to the Western Front at a planning level. At a tactical level, I think it's, it's, it's rather different. But, but, but at the higher level, I'm not sure there is. Although if anybody's got any information on this or thoughts on this, I'd be fascinated to hear them. OK, thanks. You've touched on something here from uh, uh, from our friend in, in Turkey. And um, apologies for not pronouncing your name correctly here, Tunke. Tunke Yilmaz has said, the Hague rebuked Lieutenant General Sir William Birdwood, commander of First Anzac and his Chief of Staff, um, Brigadier General um, Brundle White, after the failure of Second Australian Division at uh, Pozier. Uh, you are not fighting battery bazooks now. Uh, this is serious scientific war, and you are up against the most scientific and most, uh, and most military nation in Europe. Um, Haig's comment, this is Tunke's question, Haig's comments were harsh and tactless, but were not entirely without foundation. D did this term reflect all British High Command uh, during the First World War, is, uh, is his question. Well, that, that sound, sounds like Amy and I can chip in afterwards. Yeah, I'm happy to ask that. So, so I think we need to acknowledge that the British Army at this time is very has a lot of kind of racial stereotyping running through it. And I think that views, particularly on Ottoman forces, we can take this back to Gladstone's rhetoric around the, the, the Great Eastern Crisis of 1875 to 78, where he, he, he stands up and he talks about like degeneracy in the Ottoman Empire. He talks about the, the terrible Turk. And so I think that that quite sort of racialized language and perception of the Ottomans and the Turks in terms of their, you know, their approach to life, their background, their culture. I think we can see aspects of that permeating into um, the senior levels of the British army. And, you know, my research into to Guy Dornay's correspondence, you know, he he's writing about one of his colleagues on the staff, Wyndham Deeds, who you know, is working in the Ottoman Empire and he's works, he works there for five years and he speaks about how he likes the Turks individually, but he realises, and I'm quoting here, that they are a pretty worthless race in spite of certain good qualities. And so this is just the kind of the language that's being used, which is, you know, entirely unacceptable to, to us today. And so I think it's almost a shock when actually, whether it's in Gallipoli, whether it's in the Palestine campaign, that there's actually a genuine shock when when they're not the pushover I think that the, the British army expects them to be. So I think that there's a degree of arrogance and complacency and this idea, which we can perhaps also trace back to the pre-war, that when you are fighting a, a peer or a near peer enemy, as we would use the terminology today, of someone like Germany or France, is that what you need in terms of your mindset and your tactics are very different to what you would perhaps employ if you were fighting the Ottomans or of course the various kind of colonial insurgencies that, that the British army is being used to, to kind of put down across its empire. So I think it's widespread. It's definitely present in quite a kind of, as you say, tactless, but also quite a racist way in, in a lot of the correspondence at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I'd just simply add to that, I mean, that's, that's, that's spot on. Um, that sort of arrogance and underestimation of the Ottomans is the basic reason why they launched the Gallipoli campaign in the form they did in the first place. They didn't think that the Turks had put up much, much of a fight. It's also worth pointing out that, of course, at the tactical level, uh, British and Anzac troops came to have some regard for their Turkish enemies. So Johnny Turk or Jacko, as Australians would call them, a very different uh, idea but but people like Hague who hadn't actually fought against the Ottomans really engaged in these stereotypes so I mean I think uh, Tunke quoted me actually by sound it from 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 one, one of my books my point was that um, it was tactless but not um, um, entirely un inaccurate about his comments about the Australians not about the Turks of course okay thanks Steve Chambers um, says the following, Amy, a very interesting talk. There are numerous examples of tactically, tactical innovations being used at Gallipoli, such as indirect machine gun fire, barrage and harassing, bite and hold, and you have already mentioned the Lone Pine example of 
closing the assaulting distances in attacks, some of which were a year before we see them on the Western Front. Whilst it sounds like there was no effective process for sharing knowledge outside theatre, when knowledge was shared, does your research show any resistance from commanders with their adoption? That's from Steve Chambers. Steve, that's a great question. Um, and yeah, there, there's certainly resistance. And I, you know, it's not it's not just limited to, um, to, to Gallipoli either. I think that this is a is a long-standing issue and I think that we can we can see aspects of this rooted in like imperial history as well and about the idea of the centre and the periphery so we think about the western front as the centre as the main theatre and then the other theatres you know the sideshow theatres there, there's this feeling that whatever is being done in there is fine for that theatre but that it has very little place on the western front and so you get people like Lancelot Kidgel for example saying, you know, well, in those theatres, they're not up against it in the same way that, that we are here on the Western Front. So even at the highest levels, there is a degree of sort of reticence, is probably being generous, but, but a degree of resistance. And we, we see aspects of this, um, particularly when looking at the, like the malaria replacements, so those divisions that come back from Palestine to the Western Front in 1918. So I appreciate, you know, beyond the sort of the parameters of this conference is that you get some who've been involved in in pursuits in more kind of harassing forms of, of operations and they get to the western front and they're kind of given a real shakedown and told well, you shouldn't really be doing that that's not how we do things here and so even at like the tactical level there's a kind of licking askance at like you know what could you possibly bring to us that we don't already know here and so there is that kind of initial resistance and I think you see that throughout the course of the war. I think what's a really potential fruitful area of research though, is what's happening like between the sideshow theatres. Some are incredibly well connected in terms of administrative links, but how are say lessons from Mesopotamia being transferred to, to Palestine and vice versa. And so I think that, I would say this right, but I think there's still so much work to do in this area, which ties into ideas of, you know, resistance and friction um, about sort of what's seen as a good innovation or a good development and what isn't. And I think that is a really important part of understanding innovation are like the personal biases that people bring to them. And like, do you have the right people backing you up when you're putting these kind of technological ideas forward? So it's a bit of a kind of roundabout broader way of, of answering the question, um, but it's a really interesting one. So thank you. If I could just chip in here, I mean, I mean maybe Amy can answer this. Of course, it strikes me that Hamilton comes up with a form of bias and hold in Gallipoli roughly the same time as they're coming up with that on the Western Front. I assume these are two uh, independent discoveries of the same method, or, or is there any attempt to share knowledge between, between the two theatres? Yeah, so I, like looking through Hamilton's papers, um, you know, I've, I've not looked through them as extensively as I know some people have, but I've not come across anything where he's he's saying, you know, this is what we're doing in Gallipoli in, in regards to that kind of form of, of bite and hold. There's certainly other conversations that are happening, for example, as, as I pointed out, between like Rawlinson and, and Godley and Rawlinson and Braithwaite as well. So, you know, it's not like unrealistic to assume there might have been some some pull across but you know this is this is one of the frustrating things right about obviously doing historical research but about stuff like learning is that unless it's captured some way it's you know it could well have happened but because we don't have it in the archive it's really hard to substantiate and and this raises broader questions about you know bad bad or failed innovations like only the ones that are really successful are kind of captured. So that, does that present like a, a false positive about like how innovative all of these various armies are? Because actually it's a lot harder to find things that have failed or haven't gone quite right. And, you know, again, there's there's a whole other research project in that, I think. If I could just chip in a, a little bit more. Um, I, I've done some work on Gallipoli a year or two ago now. And it struck me that by the time the End, end of the campaign had come out, actually many troops become really quite proficient to trench warfare. And that strikes me as a combination of, yes, they were reading some stuff which had come from the Western Front and talked to people, what have you, but also just learning and doing it. 
and and so I just supporting what you're saying really it's 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 two streams it's actually you know sharing information but just learning through doing okay thanks Steve Mason asks the following and this is uh, for, for Amy um Amy you mentioned personal relationships as a route for sharing experiences are you aware of any cases where personal dislike between officers prevents a take-up of useful experience? I particularly like that question because it's uh, hopefully quite anecdotal. Um, over to you, Amy. What a great question. Um, I wish I'd found that kind of like, you know, the slight tension. I mean, ev everyone knows that there are certain rivalries and dislikes between certain officers. And again, this part of this comes back to the fact that they maybe wouldn't necessarily be capturing or writing that down. There's certainly sort of anecdotal points about someone writing to a colleague or a friend thinking that a, a particular idea is, is not very good and because of the person it's come from, um, you know, and you get some of this skepticism, particularly around like the inspectorate of training that comes in later in the war about people being like, why, why is this happen? And it's not any fault of, of either Maxis. It's just, there's just a reticence towards it. So I've not, I've not found anything like that. And I really wish that I could, because I think that that would just underline, you know, the British army as being a, an incredibly social organization uh, for all of the good and bad that that brings. So I'm really sorry to disappoint you, but I haven't, but I wonder if, if any of my other kind of panelists have, have come across anything like that. I, I think uh, the, the one thing, Amy, I, I would add to that is that it's not just the military. Um, if you take the um, J.S. Haldane and from Oxford and um, Herbert Baker from Imperial College, um, anecdotally, just didn't get on. Um, did that get in the way of um, the development of, uh, of their anti-gas ideas? They'd thrash it out. But I think it's uh, that's human nature that everybody won't agree. And, uh, and in fact, I think Haldane um, sort of backs off a little bit from the rest of the development programme because of the the, the differences so it's not not something you might limit to the um, the military people are people that's a really good point actually yeah was the uh, most extreme example of that is the tensions between French and Smith Dorian um, which uh, culminated in uh, Oracy of Rose. it's just gone 12 so I'm going to squeeze in one final question um, uh, which uh, maybe for Rocky, but maybe for a wider uh, um, group discussion um, from Ruth Wetherill. Ruth asks, do the innovation mechanisms in gas area reflect innovation in other areas such as tanks? Um, well, if I, if I start off to say the, the innovation, I think, starts at the front line um, in, in all cases. And uh, I, I did notice there was another question there, David, that um, someone asked what, about um, uh, Tim Cook's book uh, and who actually was the first person to actually recognize the fact Well, I think the, the reference in Tim Cook's book, which, which by the way is I think one of the best books you can read on gas warfare. If you, if you want to read the end to end story of the war, it's about the Canadians, but uh, the, the, I think the character he refers to in his book is uh, George Naismith, who uh, he was either a captain or a major, uh, but he was in the Canadian division sanitation unit and one of the things there is the, the there's a bit of a link there which says the expertise to to have the knowledge to define what that gas was on the front line would have invariably sat with those sanitation units because they were chemists they were they were involved in doing the tests and and actually used chlorine um, so whether it was George uh, Naismith the story runs that George Naismith is is summoned to headquarters he he reports it in um, um, to whether it's uh, this, I think it, I think it is General French, but the, there are other accounts where it's, it's Rawlinson he reports to. Uh, but he, I think he says he walks away from the meeting saying um, that um, he, he left, left, leaves the general's office um, with a feeling that he'd been of real use in the war if he did nothing else. Um, so the expertise starts, and that's where the, I think, uh, and this will probably aim over to Amy now, but the learning process always starts with the fundamental user. Um, which then has to go back through some scientific development, uh, the Good Ideas Club, and then the, you, you, it, the, there's a, a, a circle, which is concept, development of the concept, delivery of the concept, uh, use of the concept, and then the um, feedback 
loop, which is the modification of the concept. So innovation always starts that ball rolling. It's the level of expertise you get in whatever whatever area. Um, I assume it will be the same for tanks, for machine gun uh, development, or, or, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a really it's a really great question, and and I think like Rocky has really highlighted some of I mean how we think about innovation today as well. Um, we can see sort of like the principles of that during the First World War, but I think you know if we take the example of the tank. You know, this is an innovation that has almost has multiple kind of parents in a way and that you've got people who have vested interest in this. And so, you know, I think one of the things that we need to bear in mind when we think about innovation is is that it is a is a team effort in lots of ways, whether that's, you know, as, as Rocky's pointed out, you know, the people who are red teaming it or troubleshooting it, the people who are then using it and then, you know, the refinement of that. We think about the tank, you have you know, industry involved, you have obviously the Admiralty are kind of doing something on the side and you've got like the highest levels of government backing this. And so this is a technology that although is is military, is it straddles more, it sticks across more than just, you know, the British Army. And I think we can see that in, in lots of different ways, whether we look at sort of tactical innovations and developments, the codification of that in pamphlets and then the the revisiting of that as well and i think we can read this across to to the german army so i know there are a few questions related to the german army is that people like robert foley for example would argue that the germans actually have a really effective way of of thinking about tactical innovations or doctrinal innovations because they've built the pathways in the organization to rapidly move best practice from the front line up to the top of the organization and then back down and then building in opportunities for red teaming. So like, I think von Lossberg, for example, is requested by higher command to actually be overly critical about a piece of defensive doctrine to, to ensure that it is fit for purpose. So I think that we see all armies in the First World War approaching innovation, but with their own different kind of organisational, cultural take on things. But I think that the, the fundamental, the building blocks there are, are as rocky as, as highlighted and, and actually remain broadly the same today. I think the instance with, um, with George Naismith is a good example is that very quickly, I think within two days of the attack, he, he's already suggesting the fact with his background knowledge, is uh, and we do in the military these days, is the is that you, ref, you refer back to your subject matter experts. And chemical warfare is very complex, um, but I think um, George Naismith very early says, do you know what, with my expert opinion, my expert opinion is that we need to use hypo-sulfite, the, the photographic um, uh, um, d d development agent, um, hypersulfite of soda. He makes that suggestion around about the 24th of April to General French of Rawlinson, whoever it is. Um, but it's it's Baker and it's the team back at Millbank that then put that um, into absolute practical application. Okay, thanks. Gary, do you want to just uh, sum up this morning's session? Um, we've got 14 questions still open, and so we don't stand a prayer of, uh, <laughs> of answering these. Um, so, Gary, over to you. Thank you. Well, I can answer one of them. Somebody asked me, what are the two books on Loose that I recommended? There's the one by, by Gordon Corrigan and one by Nick Lloyd. Um, well, thanks, everybody, for a terrific morning excellent papers and some really good questions which stimulated some good discussion which I think is exactly how it should be. One theme which strikes me coming out from all three presentations and the questions is 1915 really is a watershed year. We have got if you like the end of the beginning of the First World War and the beginning of the middle bit. So we've seen so much um, this morning that 1915 is a year of transition, whether it be in learning lessons, in gas, in recruitment for officers and all the rest of it, which I think just adds to the importance of studying more about this year. Now, if I was going to sort of suggest future avenues of research, it really would be to 
try and put 1915 into this broader context because so many of the things, in fact, all, all three of our speakers have inevitably strayed beyond the end of 1915 to look at what happens later in the war, but so much can be traced back to origins in this year, 1915. So it remains neglected for reasons I've, I suggested earlier on. It simply doesn't fit into the great British narrative of the First World War, either the popular one or, to be honest, the scholarly one as much as it should, but it's, it is a neglected year and this morning's presentation has shown what the areas in which there's still need for really important research. So again, thank you very much. Um, David, do you want to give us our uh, um, final instructions? Th thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks, uh, Amy, Roger and Rocky and obviously Gary as well. Yes, absolutely true, Gary. Um, neglected, but um, less neglected now, and also less ne I'll try again. Less neglected um, between two and four this afternoon when we'll have, a, have another bite of the oak cherry. So if uh, if if you were uh, haven't already done so, please register for this afternoon's session. If you haven't done so already, please register for the WFA's webinars on Monday evenings. Um, I'm going to end this session now. We'll get a, a spot of lunch and we'll re rejoin everybody at two o'clock um, for the afternoon session. But once again, um, thanks to our spe three speakers, but above all, thanks to everybody for, for, for joining us. Thanks very much and see you later. Mademoiselle from Armitage, Mademoiselle from Armitage,